Trying to prove your value is proof that you have already forgotten yours. It might be frivolous, but here's an example. I've never seen a Lamborghini commercial. Never. I've seen a Honda commercial. I've seen a Ford commercial. Ford is the best in Texas. I've seen Nissan commercials. I've seen Ram commercials, but I've never seen a Lamborghini commercial. And if you research it, Lamborghini says we don't run commercials because our, our product in itself has value that speaks for itself. So I don't need to market it. I don't need to commercialize it because when you know your value, you don't have to try to convince people who don't. See, please hear me, y'all. Trying to prove your value is proof that you have forgotten yours. And I'm trying to get us to get to this place. Their discernment issue is not your identity issue. Did you hear me? Their discernment issue is not a receipt of my value. It's not my fault that they can't discern that you're up anointed. It's not your fault that they can't discern that you're called. It's not your fault that they can't discern that you're appointed and anointed. Don't run up on me. I promise you don't want it. It's not your fault. Their discernment issue is not my identity issue. Ever so often, you have to have a I know that I know word. Can I get somebody to say I know that I know? I got to have a I know that I know word. I know that I know I'm chosen. Because John chapter 15 verse 16 told me so. And that's what I choose to believe. Your discernment issue is not my identity issue. That's your problem. I choose to believe and I know that I know that I'm royalty because first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 told me so and that's what I have chosen to believe your discernment issue is not my identity issue that's not my problem I know that I know that I'm called because second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14 told me so y'all better come get me your discernment issue is not my identity issue I know that I'm a good thing because Proverbs chapter 18 verse 22 told me so. And that's what I choose to believe. Your discernment issue is not my identity issue. It's the resistance to refrain from trying to prove yourself. And believing and knowing what God said about you more than what they think about you. Let's make it personal. It's believing and knowing what God said about you more than what you think about you somebody say I know that I know but watch this the only way you can have a I know that I know word is you have to read the word see you see how that switched see how quiet it got right there I know that I know yes but do you read the word or is the only time when you time you open your Bible when I tell you to turn the book and chapter so and so <laughs> because intimacy produces confidence the only reason I can stand confidently before you is because I'm consistently bowing before him I know that I know I believe that this message this afternoon is going to serve as a spiritual nurse for somebody who's on their healing journey and you're trying to understand and grasp how is it that I love them so much, but they could betray me like that. For the individual who's trying to understand, how could they ghost me like that? Talk about me like that. Lie on me like that. Because that pain hits different when you go from being friends to strangers again. Feel this, y'all? The pain hits different when you go from being friends to strangers again. And the person that you would possibly take a bullet for is the one that's behind the trigger. <laughs> As I was studying over the last few days and engaged in sermon prep, something stood out to me. I began to notice how loosely and often we use the word friend today. Compared to how minimal Jesus referred to somebody as a friend in the text. <laughs> it was messing me up. I'm like, okay, um, if somebody sends you a request on Facebook and they follow you, they're called your friend. 
all right? If you create another social media profile on Instagram or on TikTok, the first thing they ask you to do is find or invite your friends. If somebody posts a little too much, they always got something to say, they always comment under your status, you can simply unfriend them. Friend, 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 friend. Some of us, one of our favorite TV show, TV show sitcoms was Friends. All right, let me take y'all way back. Anybody remember 106 and Park? Anybody? Like GNZ and under, y'all probably don't remember. I'm talking about like 106 and Park when AJ and Free was on. Y'all remember that? Okay. Yeah, th there was this music video on 106 and Park by this particular artist named Mario, and he had a song, Just a Friend, but you say I'm just a friend, uh, uh, you say I'm just a friend, cause I can be, listen y'all, <laughs> just a friend, just a friend, 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 in fact, if you're interested in somebody and you want to be more than friends, one of the worst things they could ever do is friend zone you. I'm like, which is so, it's so frivolous because don't you know in marriage, what keeps the foundation is purpose and friendship? See, there are a lot of people who are married and not even friends. All they are is business partners. We share property, we share bills, we share bodies, but we don't share friendship. Friends, friends, friends. And I started to research and I noticed that there are really only two times in the text that Jesus refers to somebody as a friend. Like there are several references he made, like no greater love than this, than he who lays down his life for a friend. Or, or when he was speaking about Lazarus and he said, our friend Lazarus is dead. Or in John chapter 15, when he was speaking to the disciples and he said, I call you friends. But there was one other time in scripture that kind of messed me up, Dre. It kind of messed me up as I was studying it because I don't understand why Jesus would call this one particular person a friend. And I want to show it to you in Matthew chapter 26, verse 47. Look at this, y'all. If you don't have it, it'll be projected for you on the screen. Matthew chapter 26, verse 47. It says, and while he was still speaking, behold, Judas... One of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, couldn't have been me, y'all. Couldn't have been me. Just, that's just my point. It couldn't have been me. Whoever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. Immediately, he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi. That right there, I would just, ah, just real quick, I would let him have one. Like I said, it couldn't be me. Greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, enemy. Jesus said to him, Satan. Jesus said to him, friend. <laughs> I'm like, was Jesus being petty? Friend, why have you come? Then they have come and laid hands on Jesus and took him. A verse of emphasis and a clause of concern resides in the halfway mark of verse 48 in our foundational text in Matthew 26, where it tells us now his betrayer, who is the betrayer? Judas. Now his betrayer had given them a sign. Who is them? The chief priests, the Pharisees, the elders, the teachers of the law, everybody who hated Jesus. Everybody who wanted Jesus killed. Everybody who wanted Jesus murdered and out of the picture. This is important. Please don't miss this. Because your Judas is not your enemy. Please hear me. Your Judas is not your enemy. Your Judas is the instrument the enemy is using. <sighs> Judas is not your enemy. 
The person who betrayed you, they're not your enemy. The person who's talking about you, they're not your enemy. Judas is the instrument in which the enemy is using. The Pharisees were using Judas so that they could get to Jesus. Because whenever the devil can't get to you, he will start using those who can. I'm trying to help somebody. Whenever I can't get to you and can't get in your circle, I will begin to use somebody who's already in your circle. Judas. Judas is the one that's seeing your face and your enemy's face too. Judas is the one that could easily conform to circles. They're the one that could conform to the circles that want to get you killed. And then they could also conform to the circle and be sent out two by two as a disciple. Judas is the one that could conform to the circle with people who can't stand you, who are talking about you. And then also come to your face and say, greetings, rabbi. Judas is not, it's hot in here, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not even talking about temperature. <laughs> Judas is the one that is the instrument. Look, I want to show you this. I want to give you Bible. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 26. This is when everybody's at the table and they're like, okay, who, who's, who's going to betray you? Look at this. Luke chapter 13, verse 26. Jesus answered, it is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Look at this, y'all. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Huh. Satan entered him. Judas is the one that is the instrument of the enemy. See, we've been preaching this wrong. We've been telling people like the enemy of Samson was Delilah. No, she wasn't. The enemy of Samson was the Philistines. It's just that the Philistines were using Delilah so that they can get to Samson. So with all of that information, why in the world would Jesus call Judas a friend? Why would Jesus call an instrument that the enemy is using as a friend? <laughs> Y'all ready for this? No, you're not. Y'all ready for this? Why would Jesus... Called the instrument in which the enemy is using, friend. It's because friends are instrumental in helping you fulfill your destiny. Y'all miss what I just said. One person got it. Y'all miss what I just said. Your friends are people who are instrumental in helping you fulfill destiny. They're not a friend if they don't help you fulfill destiny. So I'm able to call you friend because without you, I couldn't fulfill my purpose. Without you, I couldn't fulfill my assignment. Without you, I couldn't be fruitful. I'm trying to get us to stop being mad at instruments. Somebody right now, you are bitter over an instrument. You are upset over an instrument. You feel some type of way towards an instrument. Judas was not a good disciple. He wasn't even good at his financial decision making. He was stealing from Jesus the whole time. And then after he had the transaction and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he gave the money back because he was so guilty from it. Don't judge him because he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Most of us do it for free. Don't judge him. At least he made a profit out of it. He wasn't good at being a disciple. He wasn't good at his financial decision making. Judas wasn't even good at tying knots. Like the knot that he tied in the rope to hang himself snapped and all of his guts fell out. He wasn't good at a disciple. He wasn't good at his financial stewardship. He wasn't good at tying knots. Oh, but he was perfect at his purpose. He was perfect at his purpose. Why did he call the instrument in which the enemy was using a friend? Is because friends are instrumental in making sure that you fulfill your assignment. It had to happen. I'm talking to somebody prophetically who's trying to heal. It had to happen. It had to happen. You don't get the resurrection without a Judas. 
It had to happen. Judas' presence is critical because something has to come out the grave. Without Judas, Jesus would have not come out the grave. You don't get salvation without first having a Judas. It had to happen. We don't get the gospel without first having a Judas. It had to happen. We don't get the good news without first having a Judas. It had to happen. We don't get saved without first having a Judas. It had to happen. I'm going to keep on saying it until you get it. We don't get grace without first having a Judas. It had to happen. We don't get mercy without first having a Judas. It had to happen. We don't get sanctification without first having a Judas. It had to happen. Whoever in the house is stuck, I'm trying to give you a perspective shift. Judas pushes you into destiny. No, they're not good at being a best friend candidate. But they are good at being the best destiny catalyst. <laughs> Did y'all hear what I just said? They're not good at being a best friend candidate. But they are good at being a best destiny catalyst. They push you into destiny. It is the ministry of an enemy. <laughs> It's the ministry of an enemy that expedites your development and your maturity. There's a level of maturity you could only get from having an enemy. There's a level of discipline you only get once you have an enemy. There is a level of self-control you only get once you have an enemy. The ministry of an enemy is present. Listen, Judas was for Jesus' destiny. The apostles were for Jesus' legacy. Trying to give us a perspective shift because many of us in here right now, you're mad at some instruments. In the form of a parent, an ex, a friend. Can I say it how I want to say it? Stop being mad at what helped you develop. Who's so that? What, four or five golf class? I know. I know. I'm sweating physically for y'all, spiritually, I know. Yeah, stop being mad at the individual that thrust you into purpose. Can I keep going? In fact, some of us right now need to pull out your smartphone, your iPad, and your tablets and start sending out some random text messages. Like some random thank you letters and some random thank you cards. Thank you. You only made me value peace. Thank you so much. Thank you. You only made me seek God's will more than my will. Thank you. It was the hell that you put me through that caused me to seek the grace that I've been called to. Thank you. You only caused me to have a prayer life. Thank you. You only caused me to come back to Christ. Thank you. It only caused me to serve again, to fast again, to be devoted again. Thank you. 